Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CFA Society Chicago's Distinguished Speaker Series event featuring Howard Marks. I'd like to inter welcome both our in-person audience and those online joining us virtually. I'm Chris Vincent, CEO of the Society. A couple of housekeeping notes for our attendees, and then we'll get right into the program. Uh, for our remote attendees, your mics will be automatically muted. We are recording the event. And please use the Q&A feature to ask a question. We'll try to accommodate questions from the online audience and also in person here. As a reminder to members and guests, all our events are listed on the website at www.cfachicago.org. Our next Distinguished Speaker Series event is Tuesday, February 21st where we will welcome John Rogers of Aerial Investments and we would love to see you there. And now let me, let me introduce one of the co-chairs of the Distinguished Series Speaker Advisory Group, Mr. Nick Vasilos, Head of Risk and Performance Analytics at Charles Schwab. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Howard Marks is chairman and co-founder of Oak Tree Capital Management. Since the formation of Oak Tree in 1995, Howard has been responsible for ensuring the firm's adherence to its core investment philosophy, communicating closely with clients concerning products and strategies, and contributing his experience to big picture decisions relating to investments and corporate direction. From 1985 until 1995, Howard led the groups at the TCW Group that were responsible for investments in distressed debt, high yield bonds, and convertible securities. He was also Chief Investment Officer for Domestic Fixed Income at TCW. Howard holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania with a major in finance and an MBA in accounting and marketing from the Booth School of Business of the University of Chicago, where he received the George Hay Brown Prize. He is a CFA charter holder. Howard's presentation is being moderated, moderated today by Arthur Alunwa. Arthur is co-chair of the CFA Society Chicago Distinguished Speaker Advisory Group and the head of US Portfolio Management at Aflac Global Investments. Uh, please welcome Howard and Arthur today. Howard, thanks for joining us today. Great to be here, Arthur. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Um, just general housekeeping on my side, and I guess for yours, is that all the comments today are ours and not our respective organizations. Um, I wanted to start by reading a quote from one of your memos, and maybe I'll ask folks in the audience to try and guess when this was written, and then as a teaser. So this is a quote from a, a, a memo written by Howard Marks. Says, the bottom line is that many investors setting the prices in today's market don't care about valuation. I get a sense, I get no sense that at all analysts and portfolio managers back in large cap growth companies and high, internet high flyers can imagine prices at which it would may be holds or even for, God forbid sells. I'm just curious, maybe Jeremy, when was this written? When was this written? <laughs> Well, this is a quote from April 1999. So almost, I think as you say, it rhymes yes. uh, with what we're doing today. Um, you typically write a memo a quarter, but in the last couple of years, you've written about once a month or so. Just curious why? Well, I don't, I don't, uh feel that I have a requirement to write with any regularity. And uh, I think that if I started feeling that, I, then I would feel it was drudgery. Uh, I, I really only write for fun. And I try to only write when I can think of something intelligent to talk about. Uh, I, I do try to write at least once a quarter, because I find that if I don't, people start writing me and they say, are you dead? <laughs> uh, uh, but other than that, it, as you say, uh, I think I wrote a lot this year, 
and I think I wrote a lot in 2020, but of course, you know, I do, I tend to write a lot when I think people need handholding or people need the uh, in events of the day to be interpreted. Uh, but, you know, especially I think the last four or five months have been uh, unusually productive. And I, I think that a lot of what I wrote in the last few months was quite fundamental, not, not temporal, not just about current events, but very, I thought very fundamental to, to investing. I wrote one, a memo below, I think, called uh, What Really Matters, right. that I don't think got that much attention, but I thought it was very important. I'm, I'm very happy I wrote it. I'll come back, I'll come back to that, man. But I want to start with your most recent memo. I think that's the one from December of 2022 yeah. called Sea Change. And yeah. I'm going to go through parts of it here. You, you discuss in the memo your five decades of investing, and there have been, you said you've experienced a couple of sea changes. Yes. And that we might be in the middle, perhaps, of a, of a third. You say that young people coming into the industry today will be shocked to learn that Back then, investors didn't think about risk yeah. and return. Yeah, sure. I'm curious if you can elaborate on that and what sea change we might be going through and, and what's going on. Well, um, a, a sea change, of course, is a major semi-permanent transformation. It's not just a, a cyclical fluctuation. We've seen lots of those in the last 50 years. Uh, but it's, it's, it's something more fundamental than that, a change in attitudes in, 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 uh, in what, what matters to people, what people think about, et cetera. And uh, back in the uh, 60s and before, I think the job of the professional investor was to serve as a fiduciary for their clients with very strict rules. And uh, there was considered to be behavior which was fiduciary and behavior which was not. And if you engaged in uh, in, in behavior that was improper for a fiduciary, you could be surcharged. Now, an example of that would be, let's say there are five risky bonds, and let's say that, uh, that the standards of fiduciary behavior precluded uh, owning those bonds. Uh, you thought they were a good idea. You thought that they were, they were big risk premiums. They were, uh, um, you know, that the, the returns were just too good to pass up and more than compensatory for the risk. So you buy all five, and four of them give you high returns, and one of them you lose uh, a little money. You could be surcharged. That is the judge could require you to compensate the beneficiary for the one that lost money without reference to the fact that the other four made money and that the whole effort produced uh, a profit. Right. So th th there were considered to be good and bad. and bad. Good assets, bad assets. And in particular, um, uh, high, high yield bonds, uh, non-investment grade bonds, bonds of, of double B and lower uh, were considered to be, I think, non-fiduciary. And Moody's in its uh, manual defined a B-rated bond as follows, fails to possess the characteristics of a desirable investor. Investment. In other words, bad. Now, I, I, came, I drove my car here today and uh, I don't need that car anymore. So after this meeting, I like to all go, we all go down the street and, and uh, I, know, I know you have money and you need a car and I don't need that car anymore. So I'm gonna ask you if you wanna buy that car. Hopefully, since this is such an astute group of investors, before you say yes or no, hopefully you'll ask me a question. What's the question? Who said it? How much? What's the price? Makes sense, right? You wouldn't say, I'll buy it without knowing the price. Moody's was saying, this is a bad investment without knowing the, price. the prospective return. Merely the fact that it had some credit risk. So that was the state of our world then. Right. And then in 1977 or mostly 78, the kind of high yield bond world went through a transformation. Michael Milken, and by the way, because of that view, high yield bonds could not be issued. We had some high yield bonds, but they were always former high grades that got into trouble, fallen angels. There were never issues of non-investment grade bonds, but Milken and others had the idea that it should be possible to issue high yield bonds from non-investment grade companies, as long as they offered enough interest to compensate for the risk. And that was heretical, but it caught. 
And if you think about it, now that's all we do. All we do is say, what's the risk? Is the return enough to compensate? In which case we buy. In other words, risk return thinking. Prior to that, you didn't have risk return thinking, you had good and bad thinking. So to pivot on that point, the, the next sea change you talk about is the decline in interest rates mm, mm. that we face. So in, in, you speak about this extensively in the memo, you know, Paul Volcker's success in reducing inflation from right. high double digits yes. and, and pushing interest rates to north of 20%. Yes. And you say that um, this, it, this ushered in a four decade decline, mm. and this is a, um, a tailwind that's not spoken about. Right. Could, you, could you elaborate on that? Well, uh, as Arthur says, uh, the, the 70s were a terrible period, especially in our business. I think it was virtually impossible to get a job in our business in the 70s, which meant that if you meet somebody who worked through the 70s, they probably got their job in the 60s. So they have to be horribly old today. Uh, but, but, uh, but uh, you know, inflation got up to the mid-teens and uh, they tried uh, Fed funds rates as high as 13 and it didn't do any good uh, because if you think about it, if inflation's 15 and Fed funds 15, 13, then you have a negative real rate of interest, which is not sufficient. It has to be positive. So uh, they, nobody made any progress against inflation. We had two guys. We had Henry Kaufman, who was the chief economist of Solomon Brothers, and Al Wojnarowski, who was the chief economist of First Boston. And they were called Dr. Gloom and Dr. Doom. And they, it, it seemed that they were competing to depress us. Uh, and it, you know, nobody could think of any way to stop it and, and, uh, and, and so forth until Volcker came along. And he got, I think he was made chairman of the Fed around 79. And he raised the Fed funds rate to, to, to 20. And that was enough to kill off inflation uh, as a result of killing off the economy. And we had a severe recession. Uh, 1980, I got a slip from the bank. I had a loan from a bank in Chicago, as it happens, uh, and a uh, personal loan. And it said, the rate on your loan is now 22 and a quarter. And uh, that was uh, December of 1980. 40 years later, I was able to borrow money at two and a quarter. And the decline from 22 and a quarter, two and a quarter, 2,000 basis points is little remarked. I think it was the most important event of the, of the last uh, 40 years. Uh, and I think that however much money people made in that period, the most of it came from the decline of interest rates. But because it was so gradual and continuous, I don't think many people uh, noticed it. But it was a huge tailwind, as you say, Arthur. Uh, or as you say, I say, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but if you think about declining interest rates, what are the effects of declining interest rates? Well, number one, they stimulate the economy. Number two, they make it easier for businesses to make money because they reduce businesses cost of capital. Number three, they raise the value of assets uh, because the value of an asset in theory is the discounted present value of the future cash flows. If you reduce the rate at which you discount the cash flows, then the present value is higher. Um, uh, uh, they, they make it easier for companies to borrow money and thus expand. Uh, they make it uh, great to be a borrower because your, your expense goes down uh, every time. I mean, there are all these great impacts. Now, are there any downsides to low interest rates? And the answer is governments, uh, if, I don't know if anybody here works for the government, but tell, <laughs> governments don't do anything. They, in, in the sense they don't, they don't produce anything. They're not producers. What they do is they take from all of us in the form of taxes, and then they give it out to certain people that they think should get it. Uh, subsidies, uh, benefits, whatever you think it is. And, and uh, so uh, in this case, by, by reducing interest rates, uh, the Fed made it great to be an asset owner, and great to be a borrower and pretty bad to be a lender or a saver. Uh, you know, you got to the point where bank deposits paid nothing. That's a penalty. And so it was just a trade-off. Now, th this was uh, a, they didn't, nobody sat at, in Washington and said, well, why don't we subsidize borrowers and penalize savers? What they said is, let's reduce the 
interest rate to stimulate the economy. And the effects that I described were merely the, uh, the ramifications, unavoidable ramification. But that's what happened. And, uh, and uh, but as I say, a great time to be uh, an asset owner and a great time to be a borrower. So what if you were an asset owner using borrowed money? Then you got a double bonus. And, and that's what happened. And it's, I think it's no coincidence that the private equity industry uh, grew as it did over this period because it benefited from both trends. And that was a sea change. Do you think there is, is there any, is there any link between the first sea change we described the risk return um, posture the folks had and the second sea change did decline interest rates? I think you mentioned that as potentially a, a link in your mind. Remind me. So if you think about- Remind uh, me of what I think. <laughs> Well, in the memo, you, you, I think you've kind of alluded to it here, where you say, obviously, the, the folks didn't think about risk returns. Yeah. And now with the decline in interest rates, you say, well, it's all, I can take as much risk as I want because the penalty of being wrong is minimal. Well, that's true. And in particular, um, you know, especially starting with Greenspan, who was a great cheerleader for the economy. Uh, we developed a, 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 an expectation of something called the Greenspan put or the Fed put right. or the Yellen put. And, and what the Greenspan put was, was the belief that if the economy got into trouble, the Fed would just squirt a little liquidity in and that would lift the economy and solve the problem. So, you know, people actually did take cheer from that. Uh, and uh, of course, Greenspan did inject a, in, a liquidity on a number of occasions, some of them important, like uh, responding to the burst of the uh, TMT, yeah. tech, media, telecom bubble of uh, 98, 99, 2000. And the stock market, the S&P 500, went down in 2001 and two, uh, three years in a row for the first time since 1939. So the Fed responded. Uh, but there was also Y2K, if any of you remember that, they were afraid that the, that the clocks inside the computers or the calendars would, would stop at, on December 31st, uh, 1999, right. and that uh, all, the, all the computers would, uh, as my mother used to say, go on the fritz, and, and all the records would be lost. So they injected billions of dollars to, so that people could get the money to fix those things. And of course, Y2K turned out to be a non-event. But anyway, the point is the belief in the Fed put did come into existence and, and that has very injurious ramifications because what people, if you believe that if, that if, I, if I do something imprudent and it doesn't work, uh, the Fed will bail me out, uh, that's a bad thing. Uh, that produces what we call moral hazard, uh, the belief that there are no negative consequences to unwise acts. And I mentioned in one of my memos in 2020 that I believe that fear of bankruptcy is to capitalism as fear of hell is to Catholicism. And, you know, it's the fear of bankruptcy uh, that keeps us on the straight and narrow. And when we believe that there's always a rescue, uh, that's a bad thing. Uh, so the third kind of sea change you talk about, yeah. and I think you've alluded to it a little bit, is the, um, the period between 2009 and what was in 2021, where, as you say in the memo, we've, we've of transition from a period of say easy, yeah, where it was easy for companies to make money, the economy was growing. I think you said that already. Easy and cheap to raise money, easy and cheap to, easy, uh, to issue securities, easy and to avoid default on bankruptcy. Yeah. So you said that those were the easy times. Yeah. So now we're going back to, as you said in the memo, we're going back yeah. to normal. Yes. So, well, you know, uh, the the point is that uh, at the end of 08 or beginning of 09. Uh, to combat the global financial crisis, the Fed reduced uh, the Fed funds rate to zero for the first time and uh, started in on large-scale quantitative easing, buying bonds, which injects liquidity into the economy because the person they buy the bonds from then has to either spend the money or invest it. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, it was interesting. Uh, ask yourself, uh, so the Fed put the Fed funds rate at zero, uh, let's say at the beginning of 09. 
How long did it keep it at zero? Think to yourself. Everybody have their answer? Would you be surprised to learn that it was seven years? It was way too long, I think. And clearly by 2013 or 14 or 15, inarguably, uh, the, the economic recovery was solid and, and it was in place and it didn't need any more stimulation. And, and uh, uh, you know, I think that clearly a Fed funds rate of zero is what I would call an emergency rate, but the emergency didn't last for seven years. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a, a shot of adrenaline. If a guy has a heart attack, they give him a shot of adrenaline, he comes back. But you wouldn't want to start your day with a shot of adrenaline every year for seven, every day for seven years. But that's what they did. And th so the world got dependent on zero. It got dependent. It, it believed that it would happen forever. You might recall that, that the Fed made a couple of efforts to raise rates. Uh, and it was a, a tantrums yep. about that. Uh, on uh, my book, the Mastering the Market Cycle, came out on October the 2nd of 18. And I remember that because on the, on the, on the 4th, uh, I think it was the, it was either the 10 year or the Fed funds rate that got the three and a quarter and, and the market just freaked out. And the, the fourth quarter of 18 was the worst fourth quarter in history as a result. Now, many of us thought that the Fed should not keep rates very low because uh, for, for the simple reason that if there's a recession, you want the Fed to be able to cut rates to rescue the economy. But if the rate is zero, it can't cut rates or a half or three quarters or one, you need a substantial uh, uh, rate. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but this was, this was the period, as Arthur says, from the end of uh, 09 through the end of uh, 21. Low interest rates, easy access to capital, economic growth, low defaults, uh, happy asset owners, fearless asset owners, uh, uh, eager buyers, um, and um, th it's not a healthy thing when the market is either too high or too low. Uh, in particular, um, in in the mar in an environment like I described, easy money environment, uh, what we had we had uh, companies that were burning cash, company whose uh, whose debt service exceeded their operating income and they were able to stay in business, we call them zombies, because they could always borrow more money. And of course, it became a hallmark of the IPO market that it, you could easily issue stock for new companies that lost money. Historically, the buyers of IPOs would like to have seen profits, but in this period, they would buy with losses. Another function of this low interest rate environment was that the uh, you know, we uh, thanks to my attendance at the University of Chicago, I learned about the capital asset, uh, uh, capital market line, which looks like this. That you have uh, return on the horizontal axis and and risk on the, uh, the on the vertical axis and risk on the horizontal axis, and you have a line that slopes up to the right. And what it means is that that uh, if people see an asset that they think is riskier, they will demand that it offer a higher return, or else they're not going to make that investment. And that makes perfect sense, right? So you have the, it looks like this. Here you have no risk and here you earn the risk-free risk, risk, the risk -free rate, which is usually the T-bills or the Fed funds rate. So what the Fed did uh, to pull us out of the global financial crisis, it went over here and it yanked on this and it came down. And they took the risk, the, the Fed funds rate from uh, roughly five to, to zero. And of course, everything else follows. So the returns on, Bank savings follow, T-bills, uh, T-notes, high-grade bonds, high-yield bonds. Pros in, in, at least in theory, the return on, on stocks follows, the demanded return on stocks follows, real estate. Everything equilibrates, they taught me to say, at Chicago. And so the, the slope of the line and the relationship between the asset classes is consistent. It's just happening at a lower level. So we got into a capital market uh, that looked like this. And for eight years, from October of 12 until uh, February of uh, 20, just before the crisis set in, I was giving a speech entitled Investing in a Low-Return World. Because for 
credit investors, which Oak Tree is predominantly, uh, it was hard to get a good rate of return. How do you get a good rate of return in a low return world? And there's no easy answers. You can, you can, uh, you can uh, reduce your risk. Uh, you, you can say, well, you know, those high asset prices uh, suggest there's a correction coming. So I'm gonna reduce my risk and raise some cash. But of course that reduces your return further in the interim. So you better be right quickly, or you can increase your risk to get increased returns, but is that really the time when you wanna be increasing your risk? And especially at a time when risk premiums are, are narrow, uh, there's no easy way to good, get a good return in a low return world, right. uh, as there, which makes sense. There shouldn't be, and there can't be, uh, but that was what we were living through. And so, uh, you know, it, let's say you ran a pension fund and you needed seven. So you could put together some combination of treasuries, high grade bonds, high yield bonds, stocks, real estate, et cetera. And you could get seven with moderate risk. But when cash went to zero and treasuries went to one and high grades went to two and high yield went to four, you couldn't get seven from a traditional safe-ish portfolio. You had to go out the risk curve to do riskier things to get the return you used to get safely. And that was, a description of, of that period. Uh, and, uh, and that's not healthy either. Right. So I'd I like to turn to credit markets for a second, current credit markets, but I want to kind of pivot on, the, on what you just, you just talked about, about the Fed and interest rates. So mm. um, on a relative basis, interest rates are pretty low, even in the US, even at- Low relative to history. Yeah, exactly. Yes. But the speed at which we're, reach where we are today um, and magnitude compared to history, it's pretty fast. I mean, we've gone 400 basis yeah. points in yeah. six months. So do you think, what, what kind of economy do you think we have in a year, in your opinion, and how does that affect how we look at stuff? Well, I would say that uh, interest rates during that period on cre most credit instruments were, were inadequate for most people's purposes, kind of useless. Yeah, but- And, and today, I think they're useful. Uh, a, year, a year ago, high yield bonds yielded in the fours. If you were running an endowment, which targeted seven, what are you gonna do with 4% bonds? Uh, now it happens that 4% high yield bonds were the highest yielding liquid credit securities available, but four is still inadequate. Today, they yield eight. That's a big difference. That's the 400 basis points Arthur was talking about. And, and 800, 8% on high yield bonds is useful. So this is a new, a new world in that regard. And if people can get returns like, you know, today uh, cash pays four-ish, treasuries pay four plus, high grades pay five to six, high yield pays eight. Uh, they don't have, you don't have to go to Exotica uh, and highly leveraged strategies uh, to get the returns you need. That's a big change. Does the Fed put, in your mind still exist? And how does that affect maybe short or long term? Well, I think that, I think that the, the, of course the Fed put never exists any place but in people's minds. True. Sure. But I think that it's, I think it still exists in people's minds to a greater extent than it should. I mean, look, I, uh, on, on, I make the mistake of extrapolating to Jay Powell, how I would run the Fed if I was running, if I was running the Fed. And, and uh, I would not, offer the put. Uh, so I, I don't, and I think he's pretty level-headed, so I think he won't. Okay. And, and uh, I don't think, for example, everybody seems to think there's gonna be a recession this year. Right, uh, that's gonna ask that question. As a result of the interest rate increases that have taken place. Right. Uh, but then every once in a while, people turn more optimistic when they believe that word is pivot. And that when they hypothesize that because uh, the economy is calming down and the inflation is coming down, that the Fed will pivot soon from uh, uh, what we call hawkish to dovish, from restrictive to stimulative and or accommodative. And I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think it's gonna be a rate cut this year, but I could be okay. wrong. I think that the, I think that Jay Powell uh, is an institutionalist. I think he wants to see, uh, I, th I think the, the Fed lost some credibility when it said inflation, our inflation would be transitory right. yeah. and it turned out not to be. And I think he wants to rebuild that credibility. And I think he can't rebuild that credibility if he goes like this.
from hawkers to dovish to hawkers. To, so I think he's going to ride out this year in a without any rate cuts. But that's just my theory. And I don't. By the way, I don't bet on these things. And I, I, I and I would never. I wouldn't put a dollar on that forecast. So I urge you not to. Uh, well, you said you don't. You don't make macro forecasts. I don't yeah. make macro forecasts. You don't uh, believe in them either. I don't believe in it, including my own. Uh, <laughs> so now I have opinions, and I say in the memo right. that it, it, oh, the rule at Oak Tree is not that you can't have opinions. The rule is that you can't bet on them with the client's money, and so we're not going to bet on this. But my belief is that they will not cut. Rates will not go back to where they were. And my, I always imagine these conversations that, you know, one way I try to understand what's going on in, in the investment environment is by Im imagining the conversations that are taking place. And I imagine a conversation where people are saying, we want, let's go back to normal, like 2015 or 2016 or 27. And, uh, and uh, I, I think that's not normal. That was an easy money period of ultra low interest rates, which are not justified today. And I think number one, the Fed wants to have enough room in rates so that it can cut them if a rescue is needed. Number two, I think it wants to maintain consistency and not flip, be hyper, hyperactive, uh, like uh, maybe some past uh, Fed chairs have been. Uh, and, and I think that, the, you know, and the Fed talks about wanting to maintain a neutral rate of interest, which is an, a rate of interest which is neither stimulative nor restrictive. And uh, last summer it was the last time they talked about uh, where that might be, and they said two and a half. So I think that the Fed funds rate is likely to be above two and a half for the next year as they're fighting inflation and maybe settle down to two and a half. But I did make a forecast. In that memo, you did. Which you is, did. I, I, is, I was going to call the other one down, okay. but go ahead. No, no, I was going to. Well, it's just it, it, it's uncharacteristic. Um, but I said that I think for the next, did I say several years? You said several years. Uh, you didn't put a time. I think the it. Fed funds rate will average between two and four, right. not between zero and two, and I think that's a substantial difference. In other words, to say I think that uh, uh, the Fed funds rate will be more normal, uh, and and for that. In those 13 years, it wasn't normal. Can I, can I just, uh, let's talk about credit spreads for, for example. Yeah. So yeah. obviously the environment has changed significant. Credit spreads tightened significantly from the wide that we saw in 22. Hmm. And even year to date, um, the most riskiest part of the high yield market yeah. has been be best performance. Like triple C's have, yeah. have rallied the most. Um, so I have a somewhat of a two-part question. I think you've answered one, which is, you know, do you what, what would you say to folks who think there will be a recession in 23 and they should be defensive? That's A. And then B, um, how would you rank today's distressed environment to the most rewarding times that you had? Sure. You know, back in 08 or 09, when you were deploying, what, 500 million a week? So I'm just curious, maybe just two part question. Yeah. How do you rank yeah. those two? Um, first of all, to not answer your question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, my second book was called the, the Mo, uh, Mastering the Market Cycle. And when I sat down to write it, I had a plan, of course. I'd write a chapter on the economic cycle, then one on the profit cycle, then one on the credit cycle, then one on the cycle in psychology, then one on uh, real estate, and then one on distressed debt and so forth. And when I started writing, I ended up writing a chapter that I did not have in my plan, which I think is maybe the longest of all the chapters, but certainly the most important. And it is on the cycle in attitudes towards risk because uh, investors' attitudes towards risk change dramatically over time. And it's the attitude toward risk, maybe more than anything else, which determines uh, where markets are priced. And you know, you, you take a given asset, when people are afraid of risk, hesitant to embrace it, uh, what they call it uh, in Hyde Park, risk averse, and when they have to be induced to make risky investments or else they boycott them, then you get wide credit spreads. 
they get wide because people won't make those risky loans and they get wide in order to in, induce people, others to make the loans. Mm -hmm. But then when people are very comfortable and unworried and can't imagine anything that could possibly go wrong, then they don't have to be induced uh, with difficulty to make risky loans. They're glad to make them. So they don't demand much risk compensation. And when investors don't, and this is not just credit, but all forms of investing, when people are unworried and cease to demand risk premiums, they don't get them. Risk premiums don't exist naturally. You, you can't, you know, you can't go out and find out how how uh, risk premiums are born or uh, you know created, other than through people's behavior. And the risk premium is the manifestations of people's level of worry. So so they change radically, and that's the spread. That's the yield spread. That's a risk premium. It's the it's the in it's the increased pr pr promised return, which is required in order for people to take on increased risk. And so you can read the attitude in the spreads. And as Arthur says, that there were times in 22 that with people were petrified right. that the Fed will be, would be draconian in increasing rates, that this would bring on a whopper of a recession, and this would cause profits to plummet and make companies less credit worthy. And as a consequence, they, they better offer higher rates of interest in order to attract buyers to their bonds. That's what happens when people are afraid. Uh, and, and spreads got pretty wide. Pretty wide, yeah. But yeah. now they've, they've come in significantly. Now they've come in significant because now people say, well, the Fed will probably pivot, pivot to uh, stimulative. Uh, the re the re inflation's coming down on its own, or the rate increases to date have done a lot. Uh, and uh, I don't think there's going to be a recession or there'll be a recession, but it'll be brief and mild and there's nothing to worry about. And of course, when people are unworried, then they s cease to demand compensation for bearing risk or as much. And so spreads come in and spreads have come in a lot. Yeah. So your question was, where does the high yield market stand or the non-investment grade well, uh, stand and 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 secondly, you know, um, compared to yeah, compared to history, to history, to yeah. to most interesting yeah. times. Well, yeah. well, the good news is that uh, uh, most people have some uh, scintilla of risk uh, concern. Right. Uh, you know, everything everything offers more return than it did uh, a year or two ago. Yep. Uh, or 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 ten, um, but I don't think that people. Uh, uh, but people aren't as afraid today as they were six months ago. Uh, June fear was high. Today fear is much less. Uh, spreads are in. Uh, the yield on the average high yield bonds about eight. Uh, you know, uh, the 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 lowest we saw was four uh, roughly a year ago. Right. We did see one. Uh, there was a lot of issuance in the threes. Uh, I think there was one bond issued in the twos, which kind of gives lie to the term high yield. Uh, but but uh, so you know, uh, but spreads and and yields are, I wouldn't say high. They're better than they were. They're usable, uh, but they're not high. You know, I've seen I've seen high yield bonds yielding in the twenties. When I started, the day I started, uh, the yield was uh, 12 and a quarter uh, back in, in 78. Uh, so, you know, this, this is okay. And, and, and I, uh, if, if, the, if, the, if things don't go as swimmingly as the optimists believe they will today, I think we'll see higher yields and, and wider spreads. So before we turn to the audience for questions, and. And I know Kathy is around somewhere. I just want to ask, I want people to private credit market though, yeah. structured credit, middle mm -hmm. market loans, that, that, that part of the market. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask, so that in the C chain period, we saw the between 09 and 21, we saw a lot of inflows into that part of the market. Yes. And we all know that, um, you know, just because it's not priced every day, doesn't mean there's no volatility right. underneath right. the hood. Right. Um, so A, do you see that as, you know, 
we've seen leverage explode in that mm -hmm. category between mm -hmm. structured credit, private credit. Right, right. Right. So do you see any dislocation coming in that market and maybe an opportunity there? Um, well, look, uh, you know, I, I spent nine years in equities. I was Citibank's director of research for equities. And then in 78, I switched to the fixed income department. And uh, the, I've been doing all the things we talked about since. Uh, and uh, when I switched from equities to debt, I made a great realization about the existential qual uh, characteristics of the returns. When you invest in bonds, you lend somebody money, they promise you interest and they promise your money back at the end. And if they don't keep the promise to exaggerate or oversimplify, you get the company. They go bankrupt and the company becomes the property of the creditors and they don't want to do that. So they have every incentive to pay you. And so when you buy a bond and it's promises you 8%, you have a very high likelihood of getting 8%. Even high yield bonds, which defaulted once in a while historically, the vast majority of them paid the promised yields. So the returns on fixed income are contractual and quite dependable. And the returns do not come from Mr. Market. They come from your contract with the, with the issuer or the borrower. In contrast, when you buy stocks, your return comes from Mr. Market in, in the short run or even in the intermediate run. You, there is no contract. You're not promised any return. The dividend is optional. And the capital gains comes from the fact that one day Mr. Market is willing to sell you GM at 52. And hopefully sometime 10 years from now, they'll, they'll be willing to buy it from you at 86. And that's where your return comes from. But there's nothing contractual or dependable. And, and so it's a long preface <laughs> to the answer to your question. But the point is that lending, be it structured or private, private. or anything like that right. is dependable as a source of income as long as the decision to lend was a valid one. So diligence matters. The diligence, the credit, this, uh, credit worthiness decision was a good one. Now, there are not pe too many people who are in the business of lending money who, who will make loans that that obviously cannot be repaid if things remain the same as they are. Right. That would be really silly. But a bad credit decision is one that where you will not get paid if things get a little worse. In other words, a good credit decision allows a margin of safety. It allows for some deterioration and you'll still be okay. And so the question and answer to you is, did people do that uh, over the last, you know, the private lending was really invented about 2011 when a few bright people said, you know, the banks are now ch a chastened by the global financial crisis right. and be restrained by regulation, uh, Dodd-Frank and so forth. So th the banks will not be making as much credit available. We should go into the credit business, do non-bank lending, and we can demand high returns with and, and strong documentation. And so the, the, the private lending business came into existence sometime around 2011. Uh, 07, I think there was about a quarter of a trillion of private loans outstanding, and today it's a trillion and a half. So in 15 years, I think we're up uh, six times. It has really blossomed. The question will be, you know, Buffett says, uh, only when the tide goes out do we find out who's swimming naked. Right. Uh, uh, one of these days we'll have a recession. And these things haven't been tested. We haven't right. had much of a recession since 2011. One of these days they'll be tested. Uh, and one of these days we'll find out who made good credit decisions and who made bad ones. And the, the, the people who, whose managers made good credit decisions will get the, the, the yields that were promised and the others will not. Right. Uh, we'll see. You know, the, in this business, the, the two most valuable words are we'll see. Um, <laughs> but, um, you, you know, there was so much money available to private lenders for AUM that, there, that when that's the case, there's always an incentive to take money too fast and too much and put it out so fast so that you can raise more. I think that tends to lead to worse decisions. We'll see. 
I want to pause, um, Howard, if you don't mind. Kathy, I don't know any questions in the audience yeah. or online. Who's got a good question? Please raise your hand if you got a question. There's oh, one. I'll go the closest one. I enjoyed your letter uh, at the, towards the end of 2021 when you talked about your discussions with your son, mm -hmm. um, particularly around, uh, to me, it was interesting, around valuation and, you know, the world had changed. Um, and I just was wondering, after 2022 and math matters and valuation matters, how that conversation has changed or how where, where does he stand in terms of his appreciation? Yeah. Well, look, I think he's a little less uh, sanguine today. Um, uh, you know, he, I mean, he'll still maintain that company XYZ may have great prospects for the next 25 years that can't be, uh, you know, that can't be proved today, but somebody with uh, discernment <coughs> with regard to the future can find it and it can be worth a lot. So, you know, he, he, he's going to, he's not, he's going to maintain that uh, today's prices may be fair for a company with a great future and the prices of a year ago, uh, like, you know, 50% higher than they are today will turn out to have not been too high 25 years from now. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, I would say that that approach uh, did not give enough allowance for the likelihood of uh, uh, the, the technical term is agita uh, in the meantime, uh, and we ran into some. And, uh, you know, uh, people always say, well, it's a great company, the price could go down in half, I wouldn't mind because I know it has a great future. When it goes down in half, they mind, <laughs> is my experience. You know, back in 90, 98, 99, the market was really rocking and rolling. And, and, and I, I read about people who said, you know, I've made so much money in my 401k that if it went down 40%, I wouldn't mind. They minded. it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, the, the longer you live through uh, the real world, you understand the high degree of pain that can come in the short run. And it hurts even if it turns out to be temporary. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the things I like to point out is, is that experience is what you got when you didn't get what you wanted. Right. And we, you know, we, I've got a lot more, a lot of experience in 54 years. And here we are a couple of years later, he has more experience. <laughs> okay. Do we have another question from the audience? Please raise your hand. Aphan. Aphan. Yes. Yes. Personal work style question, if you don't mind. And um, for those of us who aspire to become a Renaissance person as you are now, how do you find the time to write what you do, the letters you do, the frequency you do it, the, the books you write, as well as the day job and the multiple investment committees that you do? Can you just, what is your routine? Well, first of all, I have been reducing my day job responsibilities. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I've, I've been doing the memos for 34 years, even when I was working more intensely. Look, I love it. And, and uh, it's not- You said it was not a hit for the first 10 years though. Pardon? You said it was not a hit. Oh yeah, but I, I did it for 10 years before I had the first response, right. literally, I'm not kidding. I started in 90 and, and the first response to it was a memo called bubble.com in 2000. But uh, I love doing it, I wouldn't stop. You know, uh, as I say, I have been reducing my, my responsibilities and, and uh, uh, I guess it was, uh, uh, who was it that read off my, I did. Bio. You're, you're, no. Well, or Nick. Nick yeah. did. Nick did. So, uh, you know, if you listen to what he said, it sounded like I do a lot, but I'm really only doing, you know, 40,000 foot stuff. I, I'm not, you know, throwing the switches anymore, buying, selling and, and all that stuff. And so I have plenty of time for, for what I do. But if you look at the memos, there's invariably there's one in September and there's one in January. And that means I wrote over the summer vacation and I wrote over Christmas. And I'd rather do that than not. All right, Mr. Them. Marks, we have one more question over here. Hi, uh, a minute ago, you spoke about um, the agreement between a lender and a borrower and that contract of getting paid back. Um, when there's multiple lenders- Hold it a little closer to your oh, mouth. Sorry, when there's multiple lenders, yeah. there's a concept of strict priority. 
Yes. And I, and I wonder in, in past decades with your experience versus kind of where we're at now, say in the last five years where that concept of strict priority has kind of been thrown out the window, if you view that as a good thing, or is that another, um, you know, concept of zero interest rates, kind of where we stand on yeah. that? Well, let's talk about strict priority. So what, what strict priority means is that if a company goes bankrupt, in theory, here's an image for you. The, the bankruptcy judge sells off all the assets, and then he has a pile of cash in front of him. And then he says to the lenders, get online in order of seniority. So, you know, maybe a mortgage holder is first, and then a super senior lender, and then a senior lender, and then a junior lender, and then preferred stockholders and so forth. And the first lender comes up and he says, what do you owe? A million dollars, he pays a million dollars. And he pays off the loans as, as people appear in order of seniority until there's no money left. So the seniors get paid in full and the, and the people at the end of the line don't get anything. Now, the problem is that administering bankruptcies in this way was, was time consuming and uh, involved a lot of uncertainty because uh, you, the, the process of selling off the assets and lining up the creditors took years. And uh, what, what, what would happen is that actually the creditors would negotiate a restructuring. It would pretty much stick to, to strict priority, uh, but they there would be some horse trading. And a typical bankruptcy probably took two, three years to administer, which involved interim uncertainty. And, and, and so, uh, and then, for example, Eastern Airlines bankruptcy, if anybody remembers Eastern Airlines, it was run by Colonel Frank Borman. And, and, Borman, and, and the bankruptcy took place in New York, which is called a, 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 a debtor-friendly jurisdiction. It's friendly to the companies in, in a bankruptcy. And so Borman kept going into the judge and say, judge, if I could only, if you'd only release another $50 million, I'm sure I can turn this thing around. Okay, here's $50 million. Uh, here, uh, what about another four? Okay, take 40. And by the time it was over, there was nothing left. So, and that's called free fall bankruptcy. You go into the judge, you say, here's my petition for reorganization uh, under the uh, chapter seven of the Bankruptcy Act. And, and he starts this process, which takes two, three years and involves a lot of uncertainty. So we, we, uh, the people in the community decided they didn't like that, too much risk. So now most of what we do is we uh, uh, engage in what's called a prepackaged bankruptcy. And we talk, um, the creditors talk among themselves before the bankruptcy filing. And they come to a rough agreement of how the, the value in the estate will be allocated among the creditors. And now they go to the badge and they say, here's our petition for reorganization on the chapter 11 of the bankruptcy code. And here's our plan of reorganization. And we've all agreed to it. The judge reads it over, takes a couple of months and he says, okay. Now, the, the challenge is that this requires the uh, agreement of the junior creditors. All the creditors have to agree. The majority or two thirds of every creditor class has to agree. And the, the seniors get paid in full. They're happy to agree, but the juniors get nothing. They're not so hot about agreeing. Uh, okay, I'm, I'll take nothing. So what they, what they say, no, we're not gonna sign. We wanna go through the whole thing for three years. It's called holdout value or nuisance value. So we say to them, we'll give you five cents, five cents on the dollar. You're not entitled to it. You're out of the money right now. There's nothing for you right now, but we'll take five cents out of ours and we'll give it to you to expedite the whole thing. And, and generally speaking, that's agreed. Because uh, uh, you know, right now it looks like they're gonna get nothing. They'll sign, they'll do it for five cents. So the answer is that absolute priority is not so absolute anymore because of the need to negotiate prepackaged bankruptcies. Then the other thing that's worth thinking about in answer to your question is that uh, uh, lately there has been an increase in creditor on creditor violence, uh, <laughs> uh, meaning that, uh, that the companies horse trade with the creditors and uh you know if if you make me a sufficient offer i will make you if you'll give me more money so that i can continue to run the company i'll make you a super senior creditor which screws the other people in your creditor class right. and uh, there are now 
there are now all kinds of proactive behaviors that are engaged in so that one creditor can improve his position relative to the others. And so uh, that's another reason why priority is not so strict anymore. It's a more dynamic field than it used to be. I'm conscious of time, but I will we'll take one more question, Kathy. We, I oh, you want to take another question from the yeah, audience? Yeah, one more. Yeah, just one more. Okay, uh, one more question from the audience, please. Uh, hey, Howard, thanks for being here. I think this is really cool. Um, maybe just to piggyback off your last comment on the uh, lender. A little slower and a little louder. Yeah, okay. Um, to piggyback off your last comment on the lender on lender violence, um, do you think, um, I mean, maybe just a quick observation too, over the last four years, a lot of loans um, got made in a very low interest rate environment. Um, so a lot of uh, leveraged capital structures that uh, probably did not expect, uh, you know, a 400 basis point increase. Um, so when, you know, to avoid bankruptcy, a lot of private equity sponsors can inject capital. Do you envision um, most of that capital going in as equity or um, to what we're talking about, are they gonna take like a super priority position? You know, I'm not an expert on that and that requires a, a, a forward view that I don't really have. Um, but I think, I think the easiest is to put in equity. If you put in more debt, it, it, in a way, it makes the situation worse. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, what you can argue that what comes out of the equity accrues to the super seniors, but I think, I think you'll see a bunch of equity injected. And similarly, today you're seeing people who committed to private equity buyouts who can't raise the money doing it with all equity uh, just to get it done. So, uh, you know, it depends on, on, on capital market conditions and, and those change radically. Uh, but, uh, you know, in a, in a challenging uh, environment, you'll see equity. But, but, you know, in the past, you didn't see a lot of equity. It all depends on if there's money left in the fund because the, the, uh, the GP is not going to put it in from his pocket and you can't put it in from, it's hard to put it in from a different fund because then you'll have... Uh, uh, conflicts of interest between the uh, between the participants in your own funds, and how do you adjudicate them? Who represents the, who represents the, the LPs in Fund Three, and who represents the LPs in Fund Four against the LPs in Fund Three? It's very thorny to have interfund conflicts. So uh, I think that uh, re uh, uh, reduces the probability of that. Howard, interest of time, because uh, I'm conscious of everyone's time. I had three quick fire questions I wanted to get. Yes. I wanted to get out. Um, I think one of the first questions we got from the audience was about your memo in 20, I think in January 2021, something of value. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think he was alluding to the, the value growth debate yeah. and how that, that investing style. And Andrew, your son is a, it's a growth investor. Yeah. And you are, like we all know, a value investor. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's that. But what I wanted to focus on was Andrew moved in with you. You talked about that during the pandemic, during the lockdown for 10 weeks, I think you yeah. said. I wanted to get more about- it Felt like 11. <laughs> <laughs> felt like 11. Well, you, you, you said you spent a lot of time no, it with was your, great. It your was great. grandchildren and, yeah. and um, we all got the bond with family and yeah. for better or for worse. Um, what I wanted to get more I mean, to, to folks here is to, what did you learn um, during this period of capital liberty uh, and why it was important for you to share? Well, I always like to share because I, you know, it's, it's maybe I know stuff that other people would like to know. But, you know, I think what I learned is, you know, it was an eye-opening discussion. It, uh, it, the, the important conclusions were that one should not be closed-minded and rigid about what one should do. You know, anytime you say, we do this, we don't do that, it's, it's not a good idea because maybe the bargains be over here and you, you gotta be flexible. And the capital, the, the financial markets the, and the capital markets are always evolving. People are inventing new things. You have to stay up with it, you know? Uh, we've done 26 of what we call our opportunities funds uh, for distressed debt and rescue finance and so forth over the last 35 uh, years. Uh, 
I would dare say that each fund has done stuff that the one before it didn't do. So you have to be evolving because the streets evolving, the solutions are evolving. And by the way, the, uh, the investment business is dynamic and this, yesterday's solutions are not gonna work tomorrow because the market is gonna adapt in the meantime. So I think it's, it's, it's important to be open-minded. Uh, Andrew mentioned that, you know, whereas Buffett talks about having bought dollars for 50 cents in the past, you can't do that anymore because the world's a smarter place. And today everybody has the same readily available quantitative information. So you have to go beyond that uh, if, you're go if you wanna have superior results. And uh, that was important. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we had a little talk about crypto, you may recall, <laughs> and uh, uh, he convinced me, I think successfully, to, uh, that it's a good practice to stop uh, opining on things you don't know about. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I was, I was giving you a visceral uh, reaction to crypto, right. but he says, dad, you've made a lot of money over the years uh, through cynicism, skepticism towards new innovations. But that doesn't mean that you should have a knee jerk negative reaction to innovation. And that's obviously correct. Well, I think you talked about you know Buffett and technology and yeah, Buffett yeah. making most of his money yes. in Apple. That's right. That's right. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, again, interest of time. Your your first book was titled "The Most Important Thing." My question to you today, for all, what's the least important thing today for investors? Well, I really think uh, Arthur that the least important thing is is the short term stuff, and you know. When is the recession going to start? How bad is it going to be? How long will it last? Will, will the Fed funds rate peak at five and a quarter or five and a half? Uh, these are the questions I've been asked for years. Back in 2017, the only thing anybody asked me is what month is the Fed going to start raising rates? And I would always say, what difference does it make? If I tell you April, will you do something? If I tell you, no, no, June, will you do something different? But people think that asking about these things is being active, and it's not. Uh, and, uh, you know, look, at every investment committee I've sat on, at every meeting, you spend the first 45 minutes talking about the last quarter. What's the difference? It's over. And, and, you're, and, and you're pro the conditions that caused th that performance are probably largely over, or at least they're reflected in the market. And you're probably not going to change your portfolio much in response to what happened. So why spend all that time on it? And uh, uh, so I, I think the short term, Short-term phenomena is the least important that attracts almost all of everybody's time. I mean, and I mean, my last question, as a mentor to many- and Let me just say one thing. Sure. So what, what, re, what does matter? At Oak Tree, we try to buy the stocks of companies that will be worth more in the long run. The bonds. And you mean. stocks. The, the stocks. stocks. Like and the bonds of companies that will pay interest and in principal as promised. That's what matters. And- recession, inflation, uh, uh, interest rates, interim fluctuations don't matter. And it's a distraction in my opinion. What would you say is the most precious lesson learned in five and a half decades of investing? You know, I, I think that if, if I could go back and change something, right. I, I think that I was too conservative in my career. Even with all the success? Well, I mean, that's a great question. I, 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 number one, I'm not in a position to complain. Uh, and, and number two, number two, uh, one of the things I say is that success is always e obvious in retrospect. When somebody does something and it works, you always say, well, that was easy. You know, it's, 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 but it's not as easy at the time. And when, you know, maybe arguably 45 years ago, when I was trying to attract my first clients for high yield bonds or 35 years ago, my first clients for distress investing, uh, maybe they were cheered by the fact that I was conservative and that's why I was able to raise money. And if I'd been more aggressive, uh, maybe I, I couldn't have. So, uh, you know, but in hindsight, most of my fears have not been realized. Most of my conservatism has not been called for. Uh, I, I think it's too late to change. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, that's, that's my main observation. Well, you know, we, ha we, did, we, did, we, we haven't made any uh, big investment mistakes. Uh, oh, by the way, and so uh, another ramification of being more aggressive is I could have been more aggressive on acquisitions. 
I could have sure. gone into other businesses or acquired other businesses, which could have added to our profitability, but, but I didn't because I was careful. And I was, you know, the question is you, you want to take action because you want to achieve certain gains, but you're hesitant to take action because you don't want to make a mistake. And maybe I didn't put enough emphasis on wanting to make, take action for the gains. And maybe I put too much emphasis on avoiding mistakes. Uh, yeah. So, but you, it's your question. That's my answer. <laughs> well, let's say we could go into have this another memo you, you wrote about that talked about risk and, and people's having to think about that. But we're at time, and I kind of all the folks are here, and most importantly, your time. So, I want to thank you well, on behalf of the DSS community uh, co committee and the CF of Chicago, and definitely all of our members for attending today. And please join me. Well, I thank, thank you, you all for being here. Oh, my God, that was